Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of this fabulous series that we've been doing, myself and Dr. J. Smith, concerning the early Quranic manuscripts. And if you uh, would go and watch each one of these episodes, you'll notice that each one of them has a problem that we have discussed and a theme that we are trying to focus on. Uh, today's episode is no different. We are going to talk about something called the carbon dating uh, data as it relates to the early Quranic manuscripts. With that says, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. J. Smith and uh, welcome again, brother. Could you give our audience just a brief explanation of what we mean by that? Yeah, the, we're moving now into the fifth uh, real problem that we're bringing up in this series on the Quran itself. And this is the one that came about because of what happened back in 2015 when you had uh, the Birmingham folios were carbon dated in the Oxford lab in Britain. And the date they did was 568 to 645, uh, which problematic in and of itself, but immediately it's all over the news. This is the oldest Quran. It's only two folios uh, from Surah 18, 19, and 20. Uh, but fascinating, when they look at those dates, though it was all over the news, BBC headlined it, uh, Dr. Thomas, Rob, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, who is a the curator for these manuscripts in Birmingham went on BBC Live and said, yes, this looks like a Quran that even Muhammad could have been reading or had uh, made at this time because it follows his life. He was born in 570, died in 632. This goes from 568 to 645. Many Muslim scholars didn't say too much, and you can see why. And uh, the reason is this 568 is two years before Muhammad was even born. That's right. And 645 is seven years before the Quran was canonized, was finally written down in his final recension that we talked about in an earlier episode by Uthman. That's right. So you've got a problem in on both sides of the dates. What was most troubling though is that they were only looking at this folio and they need to look at material that has been come out. We'll put the slide up. Here you have from Julian Christian Robin in his book, Al Arabi dans le Quran. And he looked at the carbon dating research, which is being carried out in nine separate folios of the sauna collections, but in four different laboratories, uh, including Lyon in France, Kiel in Germany, Zurich in Switzerland, and the Oxford one that we already talked about earlier. Now, just those four labs, I want to show you a graph. Take a look at this graph. Let's unpack this a little bit. This is definitely a very important graph because I'm going to just tell the audience to start from the right side and see for yourself. The very first dot that you're seeing, that's where traditionally Uthman compiled the Quran around 652. Immediately next to it, these two blue boxes, if you see our squares. Light blue. So that's actually. the life of the prophet of Islam. So that's 570 to 632. From there, going left, these are the datings of the different Quranic manuscripts, or different datings, I should say, by these laboratories, which means that some of them predate the life of Muhammad himself. Just now, let's go start from the left now and look at that blue line. That is from the Lyon Laboratory for a, paper, a paper parchment from the Sana'a manuscript found in Yemen. It goes up to 550. Uh, the one next to it is from Kiel. It only goes up to 450. So we're talking about 5th century. Uh, the one next to it, the green one, is from Zurich in Switzerland. It goes up to around 550, earlier than 550. And the one next to it is the Oxford one, uh, the purple one. It only goes up to 550. Remember, Muhammad was born in 570. So those four from four different laboratories, that includes Leo, Kiel, Zurich, and Oxford, all predate Muhammad's life. How can this be a manuscript of a Quran that predates Muhammad's life if he is the one that receives it? And he doesn't start receiving a manuscript, any manuscript evidence until 610. So this is a good 60 years. All of these are been finished 60 years before he even started receiving the manu any of Qurans. So let me just unpack this as someone who was a Muslim. This tells me now that one of two, at least, at least one of two possibilities, that there is source material that Muhammad or whomever compiled the Quran relied on, 
that existed even before the life of the so-called the Prophet of Islam, or this even might prove that Muhammad didn't even exist until later, and someone took the time to compile a book and come up with a man. Or both of the above. Or both. Both of the above could also be a That's third right. option. Because I would suggest, now just like, let me just look at these. Birmingham folio, you have Surah 18, Surah 19, and Surah 20. What are those about? It has well, that's to do with the story. Moses, Mary, and... and also, it's Dual Karnain, which is right. Alexander, uh, the Alexander the Great, and also the Seven Sleepers. That's right. So these are all borrowed material. The Seven Sleepers from Ephesus. Right. The Dual Karnain is from the... Is uh, it, it's a story that Heraclius, the Emperor Heraclius, the Byzantine Emperor, wrote uh, really aggrandizing himself. This is a political tract that was included there in Surah 18. And then you uh, you have this story of Moses and Mary, which comes out fascinating. That comes out of the Bible itself. So they're all borrowed from other sources. That's right. Every, if you borrow something, those borrowed material earlier, are they not? Absolutely. Could, could these be actually the borrowed material from which the Quran was later derived? That's one way of looking at it. But also, they since they're all before Muhammad, you cannot give credit to Muhammad for this. That's correct, because um, he basically just borrowed whatever was there. Now remember, this is the Sana manuscript, which is Quranic. It is the Quran. It is it's similar in many ways. We talked about in the last episode. But it's similar enough to be Quran. Otherwise, you wouldn't have these surahs that are existing. That's correct. So you can see that it looks like the Quran the material that it is borrowed is from other sources. And we can see this just by unpacking the Quran. Let's take a look at Surah 5, Ayah 31, and it's Ayah 32. Ayah 31 is a story of Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, doesn't know what to do with the body. He sees a raven burying his brother, so he follows the example of the raven and buries his brother. That's not in my Bible, but that is in the Targumos Jonathan Ben Uzziah, written in the second century. So that is a borrowing there in chapter 5, verse 31. The verse, next verse, verse 32. O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all. He who saves the blood of one is if he saves the blood of all. That's a great verse that Obama and all the politicians love to bring up over and over again to show that Islam is a religion of peace, or the Quran talks about peace. The problem is, that is not from the Quran. That is actually from an earlier text. Take the story of Cain and Abel, a scribe right. in the fifth century that writes in the margin with his own pen about the blood of Abel. It's talking about he who takes the blood of one as if he takes the blood of all. He who saves the blood of one, he saves the blood of all. That is then incorporated into the Bar Sanhedrin, chapter 4, verse 5, in the late fifth century. That's right. We even have the documents to show it. So it's pre-Islamic, and it's a Jewish piece of literature. That blood of Abel is for the Jews. That's nothing to do with Islam. If you want to talk about where you, if you want to talk about what Islam has to do with, read the verse that follows that verse 33. He who Which does not terrible. follow the Prophet and his uh, and God, crucify them and cut off their hands and feet from opposite that's end. Right. The four now, different options. Yep. So there, that's you can see is borrowed material. The story of Abraham in chapter 21, verse 51 to 71. That comes from the second town, uh, second, uh, the Mishnah of Rabbah, a second century document, a fairy tale. The story of Cain. Uh, let's see the story of Solomon and Sheba in Surah 21. No, Surah 27, verse 17 to 44. Beautiful story, lovely story. Wish I had that in Sunday school, but that comes straight, straight out of the second tar Targum of Esther. Again, a second century account. So these are all earlier. These are much earlier than the Quran itself and much earlier than the seventh century, going right back to the second century. Could this be what these carbon datings are finding? Absolutely. Now let's move on because what's important is we do need to look and ask some other questions. Dr. Mark Dury uh, says these are his possibilities. There is something wrong with these carbon datings. Possibly the sheep were eating a lot of seafood, which is older carbon, or, uh, or the standardization is correct. Uh, the parchment was being stored up for a long time is one thing that Muslims have tried to say. This, these are just stored up hard. But you don't store pieces of parchment that are very expensive for 200 years. You just don't do that. You use it when, as soon as it's created. 
the traditional dating of the Quran is wrong, and the Quran was really created much earlier, sometime around 450 to 500 is what he's suggesting, and the Muhammad story was then attached to it much later. He noticed that none of the really early manuscripts seemed to have the verses referring to Muhammad in them. Right. Ooh, two, 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 two. Those passages are missing. Is this a coincidence, he asked, or could this be a combination of all the above? Now, my conclusions, I say, I agree with the graph is indeed disturbing. And I say there is possibly a problem with the carbon dating, possibly, because we know that carbon dating is very inaccurate. Uh, it is due to the expensive nature of the animal skins, it is highly unlikely that these skins were stored for a long time. I agree with him on that. The traditional dating of the Quran is probably at fault. That's what we're going to have to relive and go back to. And that's why this is going to hurt the narrative, the classical narrative, because uh, it comes to us from the ninth century, which is simply too late to be credible. And then I would say that since Muhammad is not listed in the earliest dated folios, this suggests that the Quran is copied from borrowed material, which would naturally predate Muhammad and the Quran and thus Maha Islam. My conclusion and the conclusions you need to say is be careful with carbon datings. That's right. That's they right. are inaccurate, are they not? Absolutely. And also we need to emphasize that the carbon dating dates the skin of the dead animal, doesn't date the ink. Since all four of the Sana A's examples uh, dated by the four different laboratories completely predate Muhammad, completely predate the Quran, and completely predate Islam. These are much uh, earlier than Arabic writings for which the writers of the later Quran are borrowed. Then you have to say, if you want to go with the Birmingham folio, if you want to go with any carbon dating folios, you're going to have to take all the dates, and you're going to take these much earlier dates as well which right. eradicates any notion that this was eternal, eradicates any notion uh, that was sent, sent down to a man named Muhammad, and eradicates any notion that this had anything to do with Uthman. And that's why Muslims, I would be very careful, go with the paleontological, paleontology, uh, the paleontologists, and the paleographical material. That is probably an awful lot more secure and safe those dates show that the Quran is from the 8th and 9th because of the manuscript evidence that we've been talking about earlier. That is absolutely uh, fascinating, of course, and I hope that the audience uh, who will be watching this uh, will enjoy this kind of material, and hopefully we were able to help you at least understand what we mean by carbon dating, because you've heard Dr. Uh, J. Smith mention that a couple of times, and you've heard us talk about uh, date range and uh, uh, early date of a manuscript and a late date of a manuscript, and that's typically how these things are accomplished. Now, the next thing we need to do is what about the Qurans we have today? That's right. Are they all the same? Absolutely. Is there and one standard Quran today? And that's going to be a very exciting one. Here so we go. And we're join us again in the next episode. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos and please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash sierra international